Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father, and as always, bring you guys awesome interviews. And today, it is an honor to have Grammy Award-winning guitarist, songwriter, and producer extraordinaire who has been in the music industry since the age of 16 and has had a music career for around 50 years. And, and, and we're going to get into all this, so he'll correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. So that's an accomplishment to itself, to be honest with you folks. And he's released his first solo album called Skeletons in the Closet, out now on Vanity Music Group. I'd like to welcome Mr. Bob Kulik to the show. Bob, how's it going? Great today. How are you doing, John? Doing awesome, doing awesome. So let's jump right into Thanks this. Thanks for having me. Dude, this is an honor for me. <laughs> it's an honor to have a, a great guitarist on the show for sure. Thank you very much. What's impressed you, Bob, about making your first solo album skeletons in the closet what's caught your eye about if anything the fact that i was able to get through it oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, no seriously um it was a labor of love and everything kind of uh, lined up in a synchronistic synchronistic way you know when fate kind of does stuff for you that's pretty much what happened and i'm very excited about it my solo record was 23 guest artists oh wow when did you start writing on this album and finally said, you know, all right, let's do this? What what was that, you know, kind of kick for you that led to this? Well, what really led to it was my girlfriend suggesting that, you know, you've done everything else. You know, why don't you do a solo record? And at that time, I was in the process of finishing the four new songs, the original songs that comprise the four new original songs on the CD with my old balance bandmate, Doug Katsaris. So armed with new songs, really good songs, and my girlfriend introduced me to Bobby Ferrari, the producer who has Vegas View Recording, which is the studio that I recorded at with Bobby. And so he provided the studio. He was so knocked out with the material. Then it was just a matter of getting uh, the list of artists who we wanted and then me contacting them, all of which were people that I either were really good friends with and known or people that I'd wanted to work with that were in Vegas that subsequently we did work together with, like Andrew Freeman and Todd Kearns, Scott Coogan and Vic Wright. We're, we're, we're the four guys who uh, I may have known but hadn't worked with before, and so now they're on the CD as well. Working with Bobby on this, and, and you as well being a producer, did he let you go on and let you do it your own way, or did he step in, or did he push you hard on this? No, because... The songs were pretty much delineated. We had demos, pretty good demos of all the songs. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like we were trying to find it. Mm -hmm. It was really just a matter of making the best representation of it. And to that end, Bobby did an amazing job sonically. You know, he he really dots the I's and crosses the T's. The studio is as good a studio as Electric Ladyland, excuse me, Electric Lady in New York, Power Station in New York, uh, Abbey Road in London, all studios that I worked at. You know, this studio was that. So it was great because I started my career in working in great studios and here finally for my solo record, another amazing studio. The guys that you worked with that collaborated on this solo album with you, how was working with those folks and, and just letting them lay down some tracks and everything? Well, it was great. You know, like I said, most of the guys I'd worked with before and the few that I hadn't, you know, we hit it off immediately and they also were the beneficiaries of my recording there and that they all had a great recording experience at this amazing studio. They were all like, wow, I haven't been in the studio like this in years. And, you know, here we go. And in fact, you know, Dee Snyder wound up doing the vocals for his record at the studio. Any songs off Skeletons in the Closet album that stand out more to you than any on it as of right now, possibly? Uh, yeah. well, well, London is the most different song uh, in that it's a song in 6-8, the slow tune on the record, but extremely heavy and bombastic. And, you know, between what Dee Snyder and Frankie Benali did, you had Bobby Ferrari's bass, Doug's orchestral and keyboard stuff, and my wah-wah guitar and all of that. And it's, you know, it's it, I, I, to me, it's, it's my, like, you know, work of art. This may be a crazy question, but I know you've been around for, for a while, but how much growth musically have you seen yourself go through? you know, up to the release of this first solo album for you personally? Well, uh, there's been a lot of growth just in terms of my ears. You know, so mm -hmm. I hear pitch better and better all the time. I'm more attuned to focusing in on what I'm trying to get done quicker, 
both Bobby and I have been producing some new young artists up at the same studio. And it's great that, uh, you know, to take all our experience and to be able to, as in the case of our latest recording of somebody new, this uh, 14-year-old kid from Florida, J Jacob Reese Thornton, fit the bill. And so a 14-year-old kid whose talent is way beyond his age, composer, guitarist, singer, we were able to, in a really short amount of time, be able to put together five really great songs that everybody uh, who's hearing them are like, I can't believe this is a 14-year-old kid. So um, using our expertise, you know, you just get better at what you do. It is music. It is a matter of personal opinion and taste. But fortunately, Bobby and I kind of are on the same page as far as all of it, the writing, the arrangements, the sonics, the presentation, you know, so and we don't settle. So we get the best that we can out of everybody. Is it refreshing, though, Bob, uh, Bob, when you see young kids like that that are actually that great as a musician? Well, musician is one thing. You know, you can go on uh, online and see a 14-year-old girl playing Eruption. You know, so, I mean, as impressive as it may be, it's a copy of what somebody else did. I'm impressed by somebody who can write a new song that's great, mm -hmm. get up and do a performance of something that's heartfelt that affects the audience. That's what impresses me. Not not the uh, oh so there's there's some kid out there that can actually play that Eddie Van Halen riff. It's 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 nice, but you know it's not what we did back in the day. That's why you know when I did all those tribute records that I produced, I always insisted that we had a you know the song was the song that we were doing, but the ins and the outs could be changed, and mainly the solos. You know I was always like you know we could start with the keynote things if it's necessary. But other than that, then do your thing. If somebody wants to hear the original, they'll put that on. If somebody wants to hear our version, let's make it different. So, you know, I, I, I would always opt to hear somebody's new, let's hear something new. Do you do anything differently during the writing and recording process to help keep your mind open and fresh to, to new stuff, man, that, that, you know, you don't get stale on it? Well, we did do some uh, pretty cool ear candy as intros and outros and some of the songs. So that was fun. But I guess, you know, mainly the one thing that was different on this record for me was that uh, on these, the new batch, not the retrospective five, the back five, but the new five, you know, I try to uh, work out solos this time rather than just play because uh, I, I wanted something fresh for me so that I wouldn't hear a solo and go, well, I've heard all those licks before, just put in a different order. You know, so I, I spent the time to try to premeditate some solos, you know, have a little demo studio at the house. And so I was able to piece together, you know, a solo. So I went to the studio, played it for Bobby, you know, you know, on my iPhone, you know, so here's the solo that I want to play today. And he was just like, so you worked this out already. It sounds really cool. But then to actually get it on there. So to see what it would really sound like for real was a thrill because it was like, wow, these these riffs work really good. And I was really happy because it was something different that I wouldn't listen to and go, oh, it's just the same old me. Mm -hmm. What do you hope fans take away from this solo album, Bob, once they start listening to it? Well, I hope that they can feel the love. I hope that they can feel that every one of these is a, is a really good song with a really good singer. And that was really my intention. I didn't want to, you know, I'm not Joe Satriani or Steve Vai or Jeff Beck. I didn't want to make an instrumental record. I didn't want to make something that, you know, to, to try to, you know, be somebody that I'm not. You know, this is, you know, I'm a song-oriented guy. And the guitars embellish the song. The songs don't embellish the guitars. Are you wanting to take this out on the road? Uh, if so, what what can I expect from a show from you? Well, first up is the Kiss Cruise. And to that end, three of the people that are on the record, my brother Bruce, Brent Fitz, and Todd Kern, Slashes of the Rhythm Section, who are also on my record, uh, we're going to be playing a hour show on the Kiss Cruise. And that's coming up next month. So that's the first thing. And then from there, we'll see talking to some agents and managers now about doing some shows. So we'll see what happens. How's playing with Bruce? I mean, I know, I know you guys are brothers. I mean, y'all miss pretty good. Cause sometimes everybody's at their throats, but <laughs> let's talk about that. Well, we have our good moments and bad moments, but mostly good moments. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's it's going to be a great gig and his contribution on the record you know writing 
co-writing that before you and playing bass on it, you know, was was one of the cooler things we've done. We're living in the digital era right now with recording albums and social media. Do you like this? Uh, and, and do you think it helps younger bands now since we do have this? What's your take? Well, there's nothing wrong with the machinery. It's the way it's used. And it's the stupidity of people thinking that they're going to be able to set up microphones in their living room, put a drum kit in there, and that all of a sudden they're going to be you know, the greatest engineer in the world with absolutely no experience with a amateur setup in, an a- in a room that's not designed to reflect the sound properly, levels and all of that, you know, a garage band and all of the, you know, all of this less than what a real studio would be back in the day. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bad joke to me. You know, an artist in the 50s went to a real studio to record regardless of whether it was a two track or not. Was at least it was a real studio with somebody who knew what they were doing with real equipment and microphones and compressors and limiteds and all, all of what was necessary to make it sound right. These kids today have no clue at all about making a record and because they're listening on their earbuds or on their computer speakers, the difference between what sounds like, oh my God, that's amazing, and what sounds like crap sounds the same on them. There's no difference. It's... It is yeah. what it is. Yeah. You know, so, you know, the, the, it's, it's sad. It's sad that the real recording studios are going away because, you know, um, bands can't afford or don't want to put up the money to do it right. And the labels, because of the sales, obviously, big bands and bands who have something going on can go into a real studio and, and, and do their thing. But still, even in some of those cases, a lot of the vocals, they do at home or guy taking one i want to do the guitar solo at home and to me uh, you know there's no vibe you know uh, we always were excited about being in a real studio and so that's why i was saying you know all the guys you know robin mccauley and d snyder and uh, vic wright and frankie Benali and all of the guys that came to the studio to record on the record they were all they all had that great experience of wow what a great studio what a great environment they felt inspired how can you feel inspired when you're looking around the room and you know it's somebody's living room yeah and and and, there, and there's the picture of their kid on the wall uh, you know no offense but that's not what i want to see when i'm recording and i always love hearing the stories of bands in a recording studio i love hearing the stories about you know hey we had to take a photo to make sure that we get all of our track set right when we come back in here you know into the studio and it, it, it's cool to to listen to stories like that because that's when the work comes in that's when you know you're actually working on something hard yeah yeah exactly the the going to the studio to concentrate on a recording rather than i'm um, going to be in joey's basement you know and it's just not the same it's just not so support wise is there a country or maybe a region that stands out more or surprises you that you get support from there possibly Europe. They still buy CDs in Europe, hmm. you know, and they're still loyal as they are in Japan and other parts of the world. It's just our wonderful country where the music has become disposable, dispensable, and if you're not today's flavor, you don't exist at all. I've got two questions here, and they're kind of out, kind of outside of like the other two band, other bands that you've worked with. I thought this was really cool. Uh, the first one is is uh, you've worked with many bands, but the one that surprises me is Diana Ross. How was working with her? Well, working with a superstar is always fun, dude. Um, (laughs) A major talent, uh, a legend. The Supremes are one of the biggest bands ever. Gene Simmons called me one day and, what are you doing today? I'm like, why? He's just like, well, I'm in the studio here at the power station with Diana Ross. We need a solo and wondering if you could come by. So I got my guitars, got into a taxi and, you know, went by and wound up doing the solo for the number one hit single, Why Do Fools Fall in Love? Came back the next day, did a solo on another song called Mirror Mirror, which was a top three single at the time. If anybody's interested in seeing me play these songs with Diana Ross, they can just YouTube Diana Ross, Johnny Carson show, Why Do Fools Fall in Love. It's it's on there. So there's the video of me playing with, with her. Uh, I also did, I did two albums, uh, played Giant Stadium, the TV show that I referenced, played Joe Louis Arena, did some shows with her. It was an interesting experience. But somebody, you know, superstar, Mm -hmm. but somebody who I was able to play with because I can play any style of music. And because I was the soloist on those songs, it was kind of like the featured guy in the band. What about working with Kiss? How was working with those guys at that time? It was great. 
you know, um, Kiss Alive 2, Kiss Killers, when I played on the actual Kiss records, it was my chance to show them what they would have sounded like with me on guitar. And having already become friends of theirs, you know, it, 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 was, it was more fun than it was not. And now here we are full circle playing the cruise. I want to take you back just a little bit. You, your very first show was with, let's see, Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. Is that right? Jimmy James and the Blue Flames, my baby band. When I played the Cafe Wa as a kid, as a 15-year-old, as a we played on the same bill as Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. Well, who's Jimmy James in the Blue Flames? Jimmy James was the name that Jimi Hendrix used at the time. And we were all there the day he auditioned. We were there the day that Chas Chandler, the Animals bass player, came down to see him. <clears throat> and a month later, we went to England and became Jimi Hendrix again. And then the rest is history. I just like to say thank you for taking the <clears throat> time out, Bob, to do this interview with me. It's truly an honor to have, have a guitar legend on here. Keep up the good work, man, and, and hopefully get out another album later on and get you back on the show. How can folks stay in touch with you, buy this album, tour dates, things like that? How can they do that, if possible? Well, I'm on social media everywhere. I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook, Bob Kulik Music. Uh, the record can be purchased through the Vanity Music site. Just go to Vanity Music, and you'll see how to do that, or Amazon, or iTunes, or like in Las Vegas at Zia, you know, your local record store. Call them, see if they have it. If they don't, tell them they should stock it. Before I let you go, good sir, would you care to do a promo for the show? No problem. Hi, this is guitarist Bob Kulik, and you're listening to... Bod's Mayhem Radio Hour. Play it loud. Everybody stick around. we got some great, great music coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour and Uber City Radio. I want to ask my metal friends out there to please keep the families in Texas, the Caribbeans, and all these places that have been affected by these hurricanes in the last couple weeks in your thoughts and prayers. Thanks, Bob. Here, here. Thank you. Hope to see everybody in the near future. Check out my record and hope to do your show again. Thanks so much, John. That's where I take my 